Hello there. Come in. Come in. Don't be letting the warm air out. I know. You can't beat it, can you? The smell of bread freshly baked. How many loaves will you be wanting? Oh, yes, I could tell you were wanting directions also, and I'll be happy to oblige you, certainly. You'll be wanting some of my cakes too. I know exactly which ones are the missus' favourites. Sorry? Oh, well, of course, you're going to see the ladies at the mansion, yes. Miss Eleanor swears by my griddle cakes, I promise you. And Miss Sarah is more a bread and butter sort of woman. How did I know that's where you were travelling to? Well, I mean, you're hardly the first to lose their way a bit on the way there. And they do entertain quite a lot of young ladies and gentlemen, just much as yourselves. There's a certain look to you that's all artistic, you know, creative types. London fashions don't otherwise tend to grace our humble corner of the world, your lordships. Oh my, you do look a little pale. No offence meant, I'm sure. Wouldn't you like to sit down a moment? I've just got to get these in the oven and I'll be with you. We consider ourselves quite the holiday spot though now with the ladies in residence. The season always begins with the clatter of carriages heading along the road to them. When I was a younger girl, I admit, I used to imagine they must have so many wild parties. So many fine and fashionable people after all head along to them. But you get to know them more when you're grown. And now I understand it. It must be such a breath of fresh air for all you artistic types to come here and take in the scenery. And they are very clever. Very clever. And excellent with their horses too. Do you ride? I dare say you must. My nephew is one of the stable hands there and he does love that job. Yes. I feel we are all rather blessed to have them so close. There was some trouble a few years ago, I understand, with their family members. But we're very protective of our own year. They've brought nothing but good to the village. It must be wonderful to have that facility to entertain and be so popular. I've known many a weary young man or ladies sometimes, though they are rarer, arrive looking solid, downcast and alone, and leave looking distinctly cheered and optimistic. Some folks say it must be hard for them, two friends living quite alone without a husband, but they seem to fill their days well enough. I can't help but think I'd be glad of the peace some days the chance to set up house with a dear friend of mine. They are wonderful friends to one another. Sometimes they finish each other's sentences, you know. They've been together now for so long. Grew up together, I understand, back in Ireland. Well, we do love to have them here. And it just goes to show with all their visitors the value of the goodwill share seems to revitalise the soul of their visitors as much as I'm sure their good company does. Shall I wrap the loaf for you with the cakes then, sir? Very good. I'll see you to the door and show you the way to go. You haven't got far lost. My darling Sarah, no, best not, my very dearest, still too much? 
Dearest Sarah, I trust that this letter finds you in good health and rallying spirits. I miss your companionship more than I could possibly say, and these past few days have found myself more and more reminiscing upon those times we were able to be together, no, spend time together pursuing our common interests. <laughs> I hope that your mother, the Lady Barrington, is dreadfully sick with some kind of embarrassing skin complaint. <laughs> no, can't write that either. That your mother, the Lady Barrington, has been enjoying the sea air with you. I have heard there are many delightful walks upon the promenade one might take and push her off. No, come on, Anne, that's cruel. Get on with the letter. The book of verse you left for me was a delightful gift to find upon opening my case. I have read the lines avidly several times. Oh, my love, my love, your words are finer than any poetry, and this is the letter I dare not write. I miss you. Oh, darling, best of all women, I miss you. If I were a poet, I would send verses to you, write a canto upon the fine silkiness of your dark hair, Another canto purely to the sound of your laughter. I love your laugh, my dear, above all of the sounds. As each day goes by that we are apart, I find myself more and more afraid that one day I might forget its sound. Your mother has dragged you off with her on her water cure, and I am trapped here without it. London is grey without you. Now, come on. Get on with the letter or you'll miss the post. Papa has many invitations about town and I believe mother intends on arranging several more receptions before the season is over. I find myself being introduced to many new faces as well as old ones. But I confess I miss your company. My feet are tired from dancing endlessly and the conversation is something of a bore at times. One consolation at least. Cousin Augustus and Henrietta are due to return to town soon and she has written to inform me that he intends for us to see a play together. Mother will be displeased, I am sure. She considers anything modern as hopelessly vulgar. But I know you would love to have come if you could. I will write and tell you all about the play. I believe the writer is an Irishman, albeit by way of Cambridge, so any latent savagery will have been thoroughly ironed and starched out of him by now, I should imagine. I am afraid, love. Can you hear that between each line as I write? Can you see the shake in my hand at each sentence? They are determined to marry me off to some idiotic soldier before I grow any older and each day it becomes all the more exhausting. I manage, oh, of course, I, as I always have. I smile and dance with them and ignore their fumbles and accept the same dull, prattling conversation ten times a night if I must. But my heart is elsewhere. It is wherever you go. I would dance for you in dresses as in nightgowns. I would brush your hair out until it lies soft as down, as if we were still young. If you read anything between these stilted lines, I hope you read this. I long for you. I miss you. I'm afraid of being without you. I'm afraid I have no time to write more if I am to send this letter out today. So do forgive my brevity, in haste, your loving friend, Anne. My dear Anne, I write this in the breakfast room as I wait for Mother to come down. It was wonderful to hear from you. I do miss London so very much. The weather here is bracing, much to Mother's approval, and there are plenty of opportunities for walks, although very few for dancing. You must teach me all of the new steps upon my return. 
so I do not embarrass myself in company. We can dance in our rooms with nobody watching. I'm so very jealous of all those handsome young soldiers, and yet I'm in sympathy with them. What could their conversation be but dulled at the sight of your light feet and wonderful eyes? The sea here makes me think of your eyes every day. Every moment I look upon it, I dare not make mention of the poems I left you. But I know, I know you read them daily. You clutch them to your heart and hold them under your pillow, the way I hold my flower diary to me. It was never precious until I pressed the flowers you picked for me last spring within its pages. The sky here is so beautiful. I endeavour to see the sunrise each day if I were able. Though far too cold to venture too far afield. Don't worry. As you might imagine, Mother is on hand to make sure I don't roam too far in one of my daydreams. It is a beautiful place for daydreams, though. I'm afraid I, I can't make myself stop. I could walk for hours unchecked or stand looking into the sea. You were always a keen artist. I feel sure you could capture so many wonderful sights on canvas or in your sketchbooks. I dream of you painting by the seashore while I watch, admiring your skill as I always have. We could make a home in a place like this, couldn't we? I would cut my hair and learn to fish and we could grow old walking upon the shore. Feeling the waves lap icily at our feet. Is it only two months ago that you drew me last? I'm no beauty, I know, but when you look at me, I pretend that I might be. I pretend that we are only two people in the world, and we are as happy. I know if you were here, you would laugh at me at this point. <laughs> too many romantic novels, I'm sure. Uh, and yet I, I have never seen romance in a book reflect what I know of love. Mother continues to fare well, and I hope that we may return to town for at least the end of the season. Perhaps if your mother were to invite her to one of her receptions. She does approve of your mother's taste in music, after all. Then perhaps you might tell me more about this marvellous play in person. You tell tales so well. When I can see your face, although, of course, I am delighted with all your letters and keep them all with me. I think you keep my letters, too. I know you do. Sometimes I wonder how long we will both be able to keep them. My imagination is too strong some days, and I can picture it already. In ten years, I will keep your letters in a box, well hidden in whosever house Mother deigns for me to live in. My cousin Albert has already made noises about the usefulness of a governess already a part of the family, and I would rather that than to be married off to some poor parson in the sticks, which I'm sure are the only options Mother would consider for me. In five years you might burn my letters, or give them to me to keep safe, when they marry you off to one of those soldiers. I pray they do not send you from England to live with him. I couldn't bear that. If we are both in England, we, we might at least breathe some of the same air and rest on some of the same land. Oh, dear. <laughs> I must wipe away these tears before Mother sees. I had best close this letter. <sighs> Very little news to bring you from this corner of the world. But do send me all of yours. Very soon. Especially about the play. Oh, so please excuse the markings on the paper. The trouble with writing by the sea is that salt water marks everything. Your very devoted friend, Sarah. My dear Sarah, no doubt by the time this letter reaches you, you will have already read of the play's notices, assuming you are not so far away from civilization to receive newspapers. That will make you laugh. These water cures are all the same. It is only the water that is wild. Everything else might as well be in town for all the nature available to the respectable ladies and gentlemen. What a bore. I had 
a marvellous time, not merely due to the play itself, but by making the acquaintance of one of Papa's acquaintances, a young man of apparently excellent pedigree, which pleases the parental quarter, but a love of poetry that amuses me. Oh dear, tread carefully now. That doesn't sound quite right. I would love for you to meet him. I feel sure you will have much in common, for we are all much of an age, and surprisingly, his interests run so closely to our own in many ways. Clumsy. But how else can I say it? He wears a green carnation. He has read all the works of Catullus. No, oh, any prying eyes would see through that in an instant. He has a particular interest in Grecian art and poetry, which I am sure you would appreciate. Despite this, Papa quite approves of him and has agreed that if I may convince you to join me, I, among with some other friends of his, make an artistic pilgrimage to Wales. There live, I am told, two highly respectable spinsters who open their house to a variety of people seeking education. Papa was most impressed to hear that Mr Shelley had even written a dedication to them. Was it Shelley? And by all accounts, they receive extremely respectable guests. I cannot explain more. But if half of what George managed to tell me was true, I feel we must meet them. How they have managed to retain respectability, despite living quite openly together, and in exile from their families in Ireland, I cannot fathom. But I must learn it if you and I are to have any hope of continued happiness. Pray write to me as soon as you can and beg your mother permission to attend. There will be many most reputable persons in attendance. I feel sure she would not object. And I hear the countryside in Wales is quite beautiful. I should like to paint it, but only if you come with me. Affectionately yours, Anne. As I read these letters, so well touched they are thin where the creases form, I smile to think of them, these tiny steps that brought us here, the words unsaid are stronger than any in the fading ink. Why is it, I wonder, that to be as we are, we find our peace in the country? The gentlemen who are our mirrors, our Anne's friend George, who so changed our lives, prefer the town. They flock to theatres, gentlemen's clubs, become artists, poets, academics, philosophers, and yet to live as we choose, we must flee in the other direction. We carve our home out of the wilderness of the landscape, lace our course at somewhere sober, respectable colours, and the countryside makes way for us in its own way. It allows us picnics on hillsides, painting by brooks, and every space where we might take our ease. We will not be named or shamed in history. We will, however, exist in the spaces between words. We are the words unsaid, between respectable and spinster, between loved each other and the sisters. We are the two people looking at your canvas painting, the painting that shows glorious green fields and wide deep skies. We are there behind the canvas where no one may see us and yes, we are ecstatically happy. No more must I dream fretfully of your parting to some distant shore. Now I walk outside and may admire the distant landscape unfolding before me and know that when I turn back, I will find you here with me, beloved.
in the spaces unseen and unspoken, we will always find each other. Thank you.